I am of Japanese ancestry and I was born in Hawaii. And in Hawaii, um, there is a, a large Japanese population. So of course, um, there's a lot of Japanese culture all around. My mother was an immigrant from Japan uh, when she was in her teens. My father was um, a Nisei, which is a second generation, born in Hawaii, in Kona. And so um, there was always Japanese culture around, and when it's always around, you don't even notice it. And it was when I moved away from Hawaii after I graduated from the University of Hawaii that I started looking around for it because it was not there. And um, that's when you start focusing on getting back what was there before that you didn't appreciate. <laughs> when I moved to Salem in 1973, there was little that I could see of Japanese culture, but it was there if you sought it out. There were other Japanese women who lived here and we formed the, the Matsukai Japanese Women's uh, Club. I first got involved with the World Beat through the first festival, actually, when they needed some involvement from the Japanese community. And I've been a board member for, I can't, can't tell you the number of years now. But I did take a hiatus in 2000, uh, late 2004 to 2007 because my husband and I um, moved to Japan at that time. And it was during that time that I um, took most of these pictures that you see here in the gallery for this exhibit. 2006, I believe, the World, uh, the Salem Multicultural Institute uh, opened up this World Beat Gallery on the second floor of the Reed Opera House. And um, of course, uh, all different cultures are represented, but they needed, when, whenever they needed some Japanese culture represented, I was involved. But this one is solely on Japan, and it's a good time for me to do it, having uh, been a collector of Japanese um, artifacts for many, many years. I became a collector of Japanese things just because I could spot them a mile away when I was in a flea market or uh, a, at a garage sale because um, my sensitivities to Japanese culture were you know, very well uh, honed. And so I could spot them uh, where other people might not. And so I started collecting them for my own benefit, and my, my own pleasure. This exhibit gives me a chance to share my Japanese culture with the rest of Salem and um, to go into more detail than I would normally do in just a conversation. Uh, conversations usually focus on just the you know, uh, an aspect of Japan. Um, so this gives me a chance to include a wide range um, of what is in Japanese culture. Um, although uh, it's definitely not all of Japanese culture, it's just a small um, vignette of many parts of it. This hanging scroll would be displayed during the New Year's celebration in Japan. It shows the sun rising over the ocean waves, which the Japanese immediately associate with their nat national origin. The sun plays a central role in Japanese culture. The Japanese word for Japan is Nippon, which means source of the sun. This section of the exhibit uh, is showing springtime in Japan. And we can start with the kanji for spring, which is haru. Um, and people in Japan just wait for springtime 
<clears throat> to come because it uh, endured the hard, cold winter. Things start greening up, such as uh, all the mossy rocks in the gardens and the leaves start leafing out. They are just waiting for the main sign of springtime, which is the blooming of the cherry blossoms. You can hear on TVs and radios in Japan the predictions of when the blossoms will start blooming from the southern part of the islands, like o uh, Okinawa and uh, Kyushu, on up to uh, Hokkaido, when to expect the blooms to be um, budding, blooming, and in full bloom. And so you can plan your activities um, accordingly. And also, uh, in springtime, there are many, many festivals that start up because people are getting anxious to start being active and being outdoors again. This is a, a set of a lacquerware uh, called Kamakura Bori, and it has been used for many, many years, at least 50 years. Um, but it's with the springtime display because it represents uh, the many, many um, hanami picnics that people take to parks anywhere where there are blooming cherry trees and they sit under the trees to have their picnics. Now we're at the summer time in Japan. This is the kanji for natsu and this um, woodcut print by Hiroshige shows um, bamboo branches that have been decorated with paper ornaments uh, in celebration of the Tanabata, Tanabata Festival. Um, then there are also many festivals associated with summer. Um, but summer also is, is a very hot, humid season in Japan. So I think partly to help them um, forget about the humidity uh, for a little while. There are, there are many, many folk dance festivals during Obon season. Obon is a Buddhist festival uh, in which um, everyone returns to their hometowns because that's when uh, for three days the spirits of their ancestors come back to visit the families. So there is much preparation, uh, such as cleaning of uh, the graves and preparing of uh, favorite foods of the departed, which they present at the fa family uh, Buddhist altars and at the gravestones. Then the neighborhoods and maybe the, a larger area, like a, a small town, holds an obon a festival with dances, the, the folk dances. And everyone dresses up in cotton yukata at that time, which is the cooler type of kimono. And they hold these round fans called uchiwa. And they also use these cotton strips of fabric called tenugui. Um, they use it around their necks just because there's a lot of sweating going on during this hot, humid season. But they also use them as a part of their folk dancing paraphernalia. The, both the, the round fans and the tenugui are used as part of the dancing. The fall in Japan is represented by the kanji aki. It's also a much awaited season because uh, Japan uh, awaits the koyo, which is a turning of the leaves colors. This is a um, model of a festival wagon, and actually it comes from the city of Kawagoe, uh, Salem's sister city, and it's usually uh, at City Hall. That's where it usually is on display, but we borrowed it for this exhibit. They have uh, many of these wagons, one for each neighborhood, and they have at the top a figure, a historical or um, mythological figure that's important in Japanese history. And then on the lower levels, they uh, ride musicians and dancers um, who are performing all the while that the um, 
the wagon is being pulled through the streets during the festival. Winter uh, is called Fuyu, and this is a woodcut print that shows a very, very snowy countryside in Japan because being very close to Siberia and Russia has a lot of snowfall, a lot of moisture comes from that um, northern part of the world and blankets Japan. This model shows the temple King Kakuji in Kyoto after a snowfall. There's so many temples in Japan um, that become so, so much more beautiful after a snowfall that silhouettes their roof line and their architecture so, so well. And this is a sample, uh, an example of a hibachi. This one happens to be porcelain, but they also come in uh, metal and wood. This is a small hibachi that would be used in a room um, where someone could sit close to it to get some warmth because uh, historically there weren't any um, heaters, I mean, uh, central heat heating system in Japan. Uh, now, thankfully, there is, but these hibachis uh, are still used in some places and for other purposes, such as planters. This is a very familiar uh, folk craft, a folk art in Japan called a daruma. It's made out of paper mache and it's weighted on the bottom. So if you knock it, it will write itself. And it is sold um, at New Year's festivals a lot, although you can find it other times. And it's sold with blank eyes, like this one because um, they have a tradition where you can uh, paint one eye in for, at the New Year's to represent uh, a wish or a hope or a goal that you would like to achieve during the coming year. And if that wish or hope or goal comes true, then you can paint the other, the other eye in. Now this one, has both eyes painted in because my husband and I used this uh, actual daruma um, when we were hoping to get a three-year visa to live in Japan. So we painted one, one eye in and when that visa actually was granted, we were able to paint the other eye in. So this one is uh, a wish fulfilled. This is a small folk toy of uh, shishigashira. There's a thing here where you can um, move the mouth and the ears. And this is like the very large shishigashira that are so um, uh, everywhere in Japan at New Year's time because it's called a lion dog. It comes from Chinese culture, but they have adapted it to Japanese culture. There are many festivals in the countryside where the lion uh, goes from house to house, farm to farm, to wish uh, a, a, a fruitful harvest for that family. And then at New Year's time, there are many um, lion dances performed in public places, and the lion pretends to come um, and nip the heads of the people that are in the audience. And in doing so, it bestows good fortune to that person for the coming year. I have a pin here that is the same um, head of a lion that I got in uh, Takayama. This is a beautiful um, set of Japanese Girls' Day dolls. Uh, Girls' Day in Japan is on March 3rd, and it's sort of a herald of, the sp of spring, the spring season. And many, many homes have a set like this that they put on display. Um, it starts at the top with the emperor and empress. Though originally it was um, uh, 
just royalty, like a prince and a princess. But now they represent the emperor and the empress. And then on the second tier, there are three ladies in waiting, uh, holding various uh, implements. Um, then the third tier um, shows five musicians called Gonin Bayashi. Uh, they are three drummers, a flute player, and a singer. Then below them, uh, this is the minister of the uh, right and the minister of the left. The one on the right is the elder, and uh, the left is the younger. Then uh, on this row here, we have uh, on both sides a blooming cherry tree and a blooming uh, orange tree. And then in the middle, there are three footmen. And if you uh, look at them closely, their faces show three emotions, three human emotions of laughter, weeping, and anger. Then on the two bottom shelves, um, there are many um, uh, replicas of Japanese furniture and things that would be included in a bride's dowry, uh, including this, this set here. But on both sides, on the bottom shelf, there are um, modes of transportation back uh, in, in ancient times. This, this one is an ox carriage. It even has a little uh, ladder to climb onto it. And then um, that one is a palanquin that is um, held up by men. This beautiful set belongs to Louise Rothrock, who is a, a teacher at North Salem High School. And uh, her family lived in Japan when she was growing up. And this uh, set was a gift to her family from a friend of theirs in Japan. So it is um, quite old. I would think I would think it has antique status at this point. And um, if you go to Japan now, these sets are on sale at every department store at, at a girls' day time, and they now cost thousands of dollars. There is a beautiful set that was a gift from the city of Kawagoi to the city of Salem in the Salem Public Library on the lower level, um, the plaza level at the plaza entrance. And if you have a chance, please go there to see one that is uh, much bigger than this one. And I would say it's valued at about $10,000. This is a, a doll that uh, belongs to me. It's called an Ichimatsu doll. And it's dressed um, in the way a young girl of seven would be dressed for the first time in formal kimono, which means it has the very long sleeves called furisode and uh, a very expensive and ornate obi and these accessories uh, and a very ornately tied obi uh, in the back. This kimono set is a formal kimono. Uh, it's a winter kimono because it does have some padding uh, here in the jacket, which is called the chanchanko. Um, and although I thought at first it was um, a kimono that would be worn for the Shichigo-san festival, uh, the 357 festival, I was later, um, uh, I became aware that those kimonos are always brighter colored, like reds and oranges and yellows. So this one is a darker kimono and was probably worn at New Year's time um, and in, in the winter. The culture of rice in Japan is an extremely important part of their culture. And while we were living in Japan, I really enjoyed watching the rice grow in all the um, neighborhood rice paddies. From ancient times until early 1900s, 
the rice planting was still done by hand. The preparation of the fields were done by men um, and women, but the actual planting of the rice itself, the rice seedlings, was women's work because anthropologists surmised that it was partly physiognomy of uh, men and women made it easier for women to uh, do the bending, stooping type of labor and the men to do the lifting, uh, heavier work. Um, and the other part of that um, reasoning is that because women were the bearers of children, uh, they were the fertile. There's rice fields um, next to homes, next to businesses, next to schools. And so everywhere you can see the rice uh, growing, you know, through, going through its uh, progression from seedling to harvest. And it um, added such a fresh green color to urban spaces in Japan. And when you were in the countryside, of course, it was uh, a contrast to the mountains, but they're just part of uh, the Japanese culture and landscape. Rice is such an essential part of Japanese uh, culture through its history, um, for political reasons, um, uh, militarily. Uh, also, in the culture where they make use of the they made use of everything, all the rice straw was uh, put to good use. They it went into the tatami mats that they have in their homes into the walls of their um, country homes and even city homes at, at one period. Um, and then they made many, many uh, useful uh, household things with it. This kind of uh, rice straw slipper was ubiquitous in Japan uh, for many, many hundreds of years. This is one example of uh, a Japanese toy. This happens to be related to the Girls' Day ce uh, celebration. Um, because these little paper dolls in the center um, uh, represented the girls in a family and they would float them away at a certain, for a certain ceremony, um, thereby taking away all the illnesses and misfortunes of, of the girls in the family. Sake is essential to the Shinto religion because they use it so much in all their ceremonies. In fact, in the Japanese wedding ceremony, um, the actual marriage takes place by the drinking of the sake. There is no, uh, there's no words like in a, a Western ceremony that that are used. But this set of three sake cups, called the San San Kudo, uh, they're graduated sizes, and from each cup the bride and groom drink three times. Now this bottle of sake is kind of special because if you look closely you can see that there are gold flakes in it and this would be used for very special occasions such as a, a wedding ceremony. The indigenous religion of Japan is called Shinto. It is translated as the way of the gods. In this religion, any animate, mythological, or inanimate entity that could inspire awe or fear or reverence, such as mountains, rocks, trees, waterfalls, and even people are called kami, uh, which means gods or spirits. These kami reside in all things, but certain places are designated for the interface between people and the gods, like the common world and the sacred world. And these uh, are like sacred nature, a certain rock or a certain waterfall, a really ancient tree, those kind of things, as well as the shrines in every home there's uh, a kamidama, which is the god shelf, and that represents uh, the interface between God and the people who live there. Um, this is uh, how a Shinto priest looks. Their clothing is 
um, style after the very ancient Heian era, era type royalty clothing. You can tell whether you're at a Shinto shrine uh, rather than a Buddhist temple is that there will be a Tori gate. Tori gates are an icon of Japan because there are so many of them and they do represent uh, the ind indigenous religion. They can be at the gate of a shrine um, or any place where um, there is an interface between the gods and the common world. There is al always a water trough or container where they wash their hands, rinse out their mouths um, to cleanse themselves. And then um, they ring a bell in front of the uh, entrance to call the attention of the gods to themselves. And then they um, clap their hands twice and pray. And then they toss a coin into the, uh, the offering box. Now that can happen before or after the prayer, whichever. Uh, and then they step backward, about three steps, so they don't turn their backs to the gods. And then they leave. The same kind of prayer can also happen at Buddhist temples too. A big difference is that there's many, many um, figures, um, statuary involved with Buddhist religion, such as the Buddha himself or different incarnations of the Buddha. There are hundreds of gods in the Buddhist pantheon, and many of them have uh, statues representing them at the thousands of Buddhist temples in Japan. In Japanese um, food, which is called Nihon Ryori, the food is meant to be consumed by the eyes as well as the mouth. So before and while eating, time should be taken to appreciate the beauty and the freshness and the smell of the food. Serving seasonal foods um, is maintaining the connection between freshness and the seasons and eating. They're all very much uh, an important part of Japanese cuisine. Rice is an important part of Japanese food. Uh, there's many, many ways to serve rice. And there's, uh, besides the regular rice, there is a glutinous rice that is made into what is called mochi or rice cakes. Those are especially important during the New Year's celebrations. You can see an uh, example of Japanese sushi and this is sushi that has sashimi or raw fish on it. Some of them uh, are not raw like the shrimp is cooked and the octopus here is also cooked. So um, sushi is not all raw fish but fish is an essential part of the Japanese diet. They are the largest consumer of fish. Japan is a culture where they have many, many festivals, but they have certain festivals that are specifically for children. Besides the Girls' Day Festival, which is re represented by the set of Hina Matsuri dolls, um, the Boys' Day Festival, which is May 5th, is well represented by these huge koi nobori or carp kites that fly everywhere in, in Japan at that time. Uh, it's really uh, a treat to see these large carp kites blowing in the wind as if they were swimming in the wind. They also have in their homes sets of Boys Day displays of samurai armor, helmets, and weaponry. Uh, all to represent um, the hope that the boys will grow up to be strong like samurai warriors were. One other thing we have in the exhibit is a very long banner called uh, Musha Nobori, which is many times displayed alongside the koi carp kites on very tall poles. They always show samurai warriors and, and their horses but they are all original paintings commissioned by um, 
usually the grandparents of boys. Uh, so although they look similar, they're all slightly different. Well, I know that there are so many people who uh, enjoy Japanese culture but have not had the opportunity to go to Japan to see it for themselves. And this is an opportunity to see a microcosm of life in Japan in a very small space, but it covers a wide range of what you would see if you went to Japan. And for people who already know about Japanese culture and love it, uh, I hope they will come too because they can enjoy it again all in one small space because not everybody has um, collections of Japanese artifacts at their homes. So please come down and enjoy them in the World Beat Gallery.